a brief history of Christian apologetics, tracing the development of two, uh, the two primary apologetic methods. Now, before I do that and before I get into this, let me just state uh, how important apologetics is for every Christian. Um, here's a premise. Christianity is true because Christ is Lord. Therefore, because of Christ's lordship, Christ is the only hope in life and death. So that basic Christian premise needs to be uh, defended by every Christian. Now I say that because of 1 Peter 3.15, uh, where Paul says this, In your heart set apart Christ as holy, or set apart uh, or honor Christ as holy, always being prepared to make a defense, an apologia, uh, for, to anyone who asks for the reason for the hope that is in you. The word apologia, um, meaning defense, that every Christian is to set apart Christ as Lord. And if you set apart Christ as Lord and find hope in him for salvation, you should be ready to give an apologia, to give a defense of that Christian faith in which you derive your hope. Now, many Christians feel this daunting, just terrifying, paralyzing in, in, in the type of fear that it provokes with what if somebody asks me a question that I can't answer about the Bible's authority or God's existence or the problem of evil and suffering, or, you know, uh, they get into these philosophical or, or, or historical or scientific arguments and I don't know what to say. Um, and, and so, you know, Christians try to give reasons why other Christians uh, feel intimidated by this. Some would say, well, it's just, you know, it's just flat out sinful cowardice. Uh, others would say, no, Christians just haven't been adequately equipped to defend the faith. Um, I would say that, uh, although both those things I think are true, I would say that it would actually be right to say that they have been ill-equipped, uh, under-equipped, or, or wrongly equipped in many, in many cases. And I think this becomes true when we trace out uh, the history of apologetics, which I'll, I'll do in just uh, just a moment. Here, here's an example. So the modern, the popular modern apologetic in our day, uh, taught many schools, churches, countless books written on this approach, in my opinion, forces Christians uh, to abandon the foundations of the Christian faith and, and to argue from a, a skeptic's place of unbelief. Uh, admittedly, that's what they're doing. Um, the, the modern apologetics that many are trained in causes one to surrender uh, primary Christian doctrines and faith and join the skeptic in a neutral place of unbelief and then argue from that neutral place of unbelief toward faith. All right, so it's like, okay, the unbeliever doesn't have faith. They don't believe these things. Therefore, I'll abandon those things and I'll join them in a place of uh, of unbelief and argue from that into faith through uh, rational argument. Um, now, increasingly, I think many are seeing the problems with this biblically, uh, pragmatically, uh, just how difficult it, it would be for a Christian in some third world country who's not educated, can't remember the ontological and the teleological and the, you know, the moral argument and all these different arguments for the existence of God, how are they supposed to give an adequate defense for God, for the Bible's authority, for foundational Christian doctrines, if they don't have training in philosophy and, and, and in all these, uh, all these disciplines that render someone able to argue from reason into faith. So anyway, many people are questioning this. Uh, I preached a sermon um, two years ago, I think, on uh, from Acts 17 on Paul's apologetic method, which I argued was a presuppositional approach, uh, that he, he was doing this in Athens when he was at the Areopagus with the Athenian uh, Greek philosophers, that he took not an evidentialist or, or, or classic approach to apologetics that would surrender all of his doctrines and then try and argue toward faith, but he presupposed all of his Christian truth and doctrine. All of he he presupposed a knowledge of God on those Greek philosophers who were, you know, polytheistic and pantheistic, and he uh, he argued from the Christian faith from a presuppositional place of truth and faith 
that presupposed all the Christian categories, and then he argued for the defense of the Christian faith. So anyway, I'm not going to do that here. I'm not going to reteach that that content. But what I want to do is get back into, um, back up and just look at the history of apologetics. Um, the history of these two streams of apologetics, because because uh, Christians have been trying to defend the faith from the beginning, but there's two streams of apologetic methodology that have emerged. Uh, one we might call the Thomistic approach or an evidence-based approach that their starting point is from reason, and they're arguing toward faith from reason. Um, the other approach would be what we would call presuppositionalism or presuppositional approach that you, you presuppose uh, a knowledge of God. You presuppose certain categories and, and doctrines of the faith. You presuppose those as you engage uh, the unbeliever. Now, that isn't to say that someone who is Thomistic or evidence-based doesn't uh, argue from Scripture, doesn't use Scripture, and it isn't to say that um, a presuppositionalist isn't using reason or philosophy or any of these things, that they've rejected all those things. That's not true. There's overlap among them. I'm saying the starting point of engagement with the unbeliever is either a presupposition of Scripture and, and faith or a presupposition of, uh, of, of rationalism and, and entering with the believer on their starting point. Now, Waldron, uh, Sam Waldron, in a lecture, a uh, series of lectures on uh, apologetics, he lays out kind of three historical mile markers, you could call them. Um, Justin Martyr and Tertullian, kind of the early church period, Aquinas and Calvin, what he calls the Augustinian church, and then uh, Warfield and Kuiper, uh, he juxtaposes in what he would call the modern church, uh, all of this kind of giving a history of, of, of apologetics. So I'll, I'll walk through that quickly. The classical apologetics, where did apologetics start? Really, you could say Plato and Aristotle um, and, and, and these Greek, Greek philosophy with this idea of a non-being. Uh, many of the early apologists, Justin Martyr would be the first notable one, um, that he took a positive view of Greek, uh, Greek thought and synthesized it with apologetics to argue for Christianity. Um, Tertullian came not long after him, and he he really put more emphasis on faith in the scriptures and took what would later become more of a presuppositional approach. Um, but you're already seeing these two uh, these two streams beginning to emerge early early on. Um, Augustine was massively influential, um, not merely as an apologist as a theologian, but you know theology influences apologetics. But Augustine's epistemological um, contributions of inwardness were significant uh, in the confessions and things like that. You, you, you begin to see those categories, uh, doc, his, his understanding of the doctrine of grace, um, the, 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 uh, the man's depravity and, and, and original sin, uh, the self-attestation of Christ. Augustine uh, was very formative in, in how Christians understood the defense of the faith, not only from those outside the church arguing in, but from those inside the church to push out the, the bad theology and the heresy from within, for example, uh, semi-Pelagianism. And, and so Augustine becomes uh, significant. Now, as Islam encroaches on Christianity as the, as the years go on, Anselm, uh, in his ontological argument, becomes very significant to argue and push out uh, the the attacks on Christianity from Islam, and and uh, you know later many people said that Anselm's work was kind of a halfway approach between Augustine and and, and uh, Aquinas. And speaking of Aquinas, he he is the most influential apologist in this classical approach. We could say um, he was primarily responsible for bringing Aristotle into the church. I'm not the only one who says that. Many have. Have said that, and it's not hard to see Aristotle's influence on Aquinas, uh, especially when you begin to look at his five arguments, uh, the argument from motion, from uh, efficient cause, the argument from possibility and necessity, um, to gradation, uh, to, to the governing of the world, and th these five arguments are rooted deeply in Aristotle. So the Aristotelian uh, uh, you know, categories are being Christianized with Augustine and brought into the church. Um, 
and, and, and to really form this Thomistic classical approach to apologetics that would be just dominant um, among many Arminians, uh, semi-Pelagians, um, those who would hold to a, certain forms of natural theology. Now, I throw out those characterizations that it, we should note um, in this camp there are exceptions, like, for example, Legionnaire Ministry, uh, ministries uh, with R.C. Sproul um, got a lot of pushback for his classical approach. Uh, he didn't take a presuppositional approach as a Reformed theologian, which got a lot of pushback, and he argued uh, with uh, with Voss and different different people throughout history um, uh, because of his unique classical approach as a Reformed theologian. Um, so there's exceptions, um, but generally speaking, most Reformed categories are, are coming from Augustine, working into Calvin, which, I, let me say something about Calvin here. Calvin was an apologist. He was not an apologist, uh, so much as a, a theologian, but again, theology affects apologetics. And so you see right at the beginning of the Institutes, for example, Calvin is, is synthesizing and bringing together the knowledge of God and knowledge of man and saying that the most important thing for us to have is knowledge of, uh, of God and knowledge of ourselves. Uh, really working out of that uh, th that uh, the same Augustinian categories, but but developing them further. Um, talking about knowledge of God, not merely is it sufficient to have a, a, a general uh, theism that or 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 some vague deity that we're arguing for. We need to argue for the triune God, the the, the, the Trinitarian God of Scripture. Um, Calvin would say that the natural mind is endued with knowledge of this God. Uh, as judge, as creator, but because of sin, uh, it does not know this God. It's ignorant of this God. So uh, at one level, uh, the natural mind knows God. At another level, it does not know God. And that God reveals himself in, in, in general revelation to all people as creator and judge. And so all are naturally endued, Romans 1, uh, Psalm 19, with this knowledge of God. Yet, in order to receive the special revelation of God, uh, what's revealed in Scripture about God, his, his attributes, his character, his nature, his salvific work, and his Son, everything necessary for salvation, we need the testimony of the Spirit, Calvin would emphasize. So uh, in, in, in Calvin's theology, the Word and the Spirit go hand in hand and are absolutely essential in order for someone to come to faith in Christ. You can see how this would affect apologetics. Now, fast forward um, way past Calvin into what we're going to call and what has been called the Old Princeton tradition and the Amsterdam tradition. So within Reformed circles, uh, these were two competing schools of thought. Um, the Old Princeton tradition uh, would really rely heavily on, on rationalism and empiricism of, of Locke and Hume and Kant and and um, a little more Thomistic leaning, um, influenced highly by Scottish Reformed theologians. So Scottish uh, common sense realism is what it's been called, uh, that they would affirm the noahic effects of sin, the fall's effect on the intellect to be able to deal with Christian truth, that it's affecting it. Um, but they would not say it affects it to the point where we don't need to still give common sense realism uh, in, in what they would see as... Um, as the need for, for rational defense. And so we're talking about men like B.B. Warfield, um, who, who said Christianity is valid for all normally working minds. And many have objected to that and saying, well, what happens if the mind isn't normally working because of the fall? Um, and so that's the pushback that Warfield would have received on that, although Warfield had a, a an orthodox doctrine and understanding of the Noahic effect of sin and, and of the fall, but he just... In terms of apologetics, he didn't let that reach its full conclusion. Uh, Charles Hodge is another who would have said the same, um, who gave four arguments for God's existence. So he's willing to reject the ontological argument, but he says uh, the cosmological, the teleological, the moral arguments for God's existence are valid and needed. And then there's pushback coming from what's called the Amsterdam uh, theologians. They are men like Abraham Kuyper would be the most notable, but Bavink is also uh, in, important. They're unconvinced that we need Thomas, Thomistic rationalism. They're unconvinced that pre-enlightenment 
uh, philosophy is, is needed in order to make an adequate defense of the faith. And, and so they're working out of two categories primarily, the regenerate and the unregenerate. And they're making sharp distinctions between the two. And so they would say, uh, Kuiper, for example, that the unregenerate's inability uh, is unable to respond intellectually to the Christian gospel. Um, he believed the most brilliant intellects are ultimately destructive to the Christian faith apart from the work of the Spirit and regeneration. And so Kuiper is leaning heavily on, on, on Romans 1, for example, and, and uh, that, the, that the, the, the unbelieving can't sit back in judgment against special revelation um, and, and, and what God has revealed in Christ because they're, they've been given over to the futility of their minds and their foolish hearts are darkened. So this Kuiperian emphasis on the Noahic effect of sin being something more detrimental and destructive than what the old Princeton tradition would have said. So you can, you can feel the pushback here between the old Princeton, the Amsterdam schools, really going back and forth over the Noahic effects of sin. Um, now, Cornelius Van Til is, is really where this all leads up to in the Reformed tradition of apologetics um, because he taught a presuppositionalism that was more developed and consistent than anyone before him. He really took the best of, of Warfield and the old Princeton tradition and the Amsterdam tradition with Kuiper. He took the best of all of, of this going back into you know, Tertullian and Calvin and everybody leading up. And, and he created a, a, a more... Uh, gave more clarity to this system, uh, this consistent system of apologetics rooted in Scripture, um, consistent with a Reformed understanding of all these other doctrinal categories, and and, and he really moved the, the ball forward uh, in terms of apologetics. Um, he, at times, would, would lean almost all fully on Kuiper and say, I'm Kuiperian, but then at other times he would depart from Kuiper and he would say, you know, Warfield, I, I lean toward Warfield because Warfield sees that there is objective rationality to the Christian faith, whereas Kuiper begins to almost, I don't think he would have used this word, but be hyper-Calvinist in the sense that he didn't think that Christianity even needed to give him a defense uh, because the non-believer wouldn't have received it anyway. And, and Van Til would have said, no, it's defensible, it's rational, objectively, and we should give a defense. And, and, and in and through that, the Spirit will work. And I, I think uh, Van Til really brought the best of everyone out and, and removed some of the things that needed to be removed to give a, a biblical and consistent apologetic. So, a few book recommendations. Uh, this uh, went a little longer than I thought. <laughs> um Faith and Reason, we'll let's start with this one, uh, by Ronald Nash. I read this back in college, actually. Um, and uh, this is a good primer on, on kind of a rational faith or that classic apologetic approach. Um, and then classic readings in Christian apologetics, uh, AD 100 to, to 1800 by Bush. Uh, this is a good little overview of the history of classical apologetics. Now, I'm obviously uh, of the presuppositional, um, you know, belief that I, I really think that that is more faithful to Scripture, um, and 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 I see this as being far more helpful for your average Christian. Uh, this is not a more complex approach. This is a more simplistic approach to defending the faith than the classical approach, um, and so I, I really. Uh, that word presuppositionalism may scare some people thinking this is some complex thing. It's really not. Um, a, a good primer would be uh, John Frame, uh, Apologetics to the Glory of God. Um, presuppositionalism by, uh, by Paul Nelson is a good book. I uh, found that one uh, a number of years ago. The Absurdity of, of Unbelief. Um, this one I'm just beginning right now by uh, Jeffrey Johnson. Uh, looking forward to reading this. And uh, Clark and Vail Ten, uh, Van Til controversy, for any of those that are wanting to dig deeper into some of the latter portion of what I just got done explaining. Uh, but really, the most, the book I would recommend most out of all these would be uh, The Defense of the Faith um, by Cornelius Van Til. This is the fourth edition. So there, there's obviously four editions now. Uh, this fourth one, 
the new type, the new layout, the, the way that, that he argues here, I think is extremely helpful. Um, I'd highly recommend Ben Till's book here. You know, he, he has become the standard and presuppositional apologetics Van Til. Uh, as you read him, you'll see why. Um, I believe it's convincing, uh, biblically helpful, uh, that every Christian could be equipped to not surrender their faith to the skeptic in order to argue for Christianity's truthfulness, but to start from a place of faith, uh, to start from a place of Scripture, and to presuppose uh, that, that starting point uh, in our defense of the Christian faith, I, I believe is the path forward for Christians. I hope this is helpful. Uh, blessings.